You, you're all ready? We're good? Okay. Okay. So we're going to call the meeting to order. And shall we take attendance? Chair Eagleson Chesselwich? Here. Vice Chair Roman? Here. Board Member Heinrich? Present. Board Member Pease? Here. Board Member Willis? Present. Board Member Wimmer? Here. We have a quorum. All right. Um, and then do we have any agenda changes? No changes. He's a point absence. Okay. And just for the record, uh, Mike uh, has a planned absence for today. Yes. Um, and then do we have any public comments for items not on the agenda? No. no. Okay. okay, so then um, shall we just continue on to the, um, do we want to do, I mean, would you like to do the schedule now? Okay. I will uh, share my screen. So uh, in the packet, we noted that we would be planning, planning to cancel the July meetings of the 13th and the 27th um, because the 28th, we are um, planning a retreat on a Friday evening to be held here in the community meeting room at five o'clock, uh, five o'clock where we would have uh, dinner provided to the board members and then kind of, pres you know, promptly start at 5.30 with the, uh, the agenda items and um, the public is of course welcome, oral communications and all. So that's the plan we've received. Um, some input, I just received something from Mike saying he's going to try to get help to be able to attend that meeting. And do we have uh, enough responses to know that we have you know, enough participation that day? Do we, or do we need to follow up with everyone or? Does anyone know they're not able to make it? That would be important to know today yeah. if you cannot make the July 28th, Friday, 5 p.m. meeting. If anyone can't make it, please say so. No, it okay. Seems, okay, We're sounds good. like it's generally fine. Great. <laughs> okay, so um, then uh, shall we just move on to discussing the retreat topics? Yes, uh, on the screen I've provided uh, potential uh, retreat topics. Um, there's also a small update on the inventory here. Um, we just received a, an initial draft uh, yesterday. So um, the results are here on the screen. So these are the four topics that were discussed as potential. I don't know if you want to um, you know, uh, not, this is not in order of anything. <laughs> the status of the inventory update, Mills Act program updates to the review process bulletin, which we're going to discuss the background uh, about that today, and outreach regarding the inventory update. Uh, we're looking at, you know, completing this in 2023. So we've, we're going to have plenty of meetings ahead of us um, once we finish with July. Um, starting in uh, September. We are uh, going to be working towards getting cover letters um, together in July and August and looking towards a fall community meeting. So it'll be good for our retreat to talk about that meeting, you know, lessons learned from the last one and, you know, how we're going to proceed. And just uh, just to note that um, of, the, of the 167, I think, um, 14 properties have been found to have been demolished two were altered enough to result in the loss of integrity and no longer eligible. And then the remaining 147 properties were found to retain their historic significance and integrity, and they therefore retain their, their eligibility for listing. So upcoming will be HRB discussing, you know, is this a category one or a category two for the local inventory and getting through that process and nominations and discussions with property owners. So. That's um, just a bit of an update. I'll leave it to uh, the board um, to talk. Yeah. So does does anybody want to you know contribute some additional ideas or um, you know suggestions for what's already on there? 
Um, so I uh, have started to become really um, disturbed that when we talk about inventory update, we're only talking about the property surveys in 1990, well, the turn of the century, basically, right? 2000. So I, I think we need to expand it to look at the last 23 years and also to look at our original inventory to bring it in line with what we are hoping to accomplish with adding properties to the inventory. I, I think that there's a potential for um, a lot of misconstruction or misunderstanding if we don't align our assignment of categories in the original inventory to what we're looking for and these new properties that we're adding. So if we're looking to add these new properties primarily as ones and twos, I think we need to look at our threes and fours in our existing inventory, many of which are more than 100 years old, and align those two things. So um, I would like just to look at how we're going to, you know, at least set some kind of time frame or some kind of plan for updating our current inventory um, in three ways. One is adding these properties that have already been surveyed. One is um, re-looking at our current inventory. I would like us to figure out how to get this all online. I think that fact that this inventory is not very accessible at this point. Um, and, and I think we need to look at properties that have become, um, you know, that have become eligible in the last 23 years since we did this previous survey. And I know this looks a little overwhelming, but I think that what the retreat is for is to get um, a clearer grip on our work plan. And I think these items are all critical. I think we need a current historic inventory. Um, does anybody else have comment? I guess we were, I, it looks like we were also going to review our public outreach efforts in that and, mm -hmm. and discuss sort of the, the data that we collected on the first public outreach meeting. So yes. I think that, I yes, think there's a lot to talk about there. Yeah. Some takeaways from the community meeting and then also, mm -hmm. you know, how we, we think about those communications going forward or, mm -hmm. you know, even how we can sort of better work with the community to talk about historic structures. Yeah, I think yeah. that there's a lot of content that we could discuss. Yeah. That. Well, that makes me wonder if we want to invite somebody from the um, past board or somebody from um, the his what what it, the historical society or Steve Steiger or people that might be able to um, help us do public outreach. So I agree absolutely that we should bring these resources in as help. Uh, and it's going to be important to partner with them as we go forward with the outreach plan. Um, I think what I'm hoping to accomplish at the retreat is I'm going through right now and kind of doing an assessment of our current outreach materials. Um, we'll talk about how the April meeting was um, and propose some uh, methods for outreach with the community, including partnering with past and those. So, um, I, from like a subcommittee point of view, I'm not quite ready to engage with those partners yet. Um, just cause I don't feel like I have a plan or proposal for going forward. Um, but I absolutely want to, uh, just when we're kind of more buttoned up on what we think we should do. Yeah, I, I think our, our, you know, two to three hours of discussion is going to go fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I would propose that we meet with past after our retreat. And um, I'm happy to, to reach out to them since I am on their board, too. <laughs> so. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what I want to part of what I want to understand at the retreat is like, OK, who has a contact at past? Go, go. Perfect. Like, great. We'll tap you to kind of make that connection. Who has a relationship with Steve Steiger? If, you know, somebody already does. Great. I, I do. Yeah. OK, great. Like that type of thing. Um, and kind of corralling all those resources. I really think we need to engage the real estate community because they're the ones out there that are providing the misinformation 
to the owners. We <laughs> and we need to correct that because every single time I've gone to an open house yep. and it's an older house, they say, oh, but, you know, we're making sure this isn't on the historic register. And everyone's going, oh, great, great. You right, know, which so. isn't up to them. Um, yeah. And maybe that's where we, uh, we were kind of talking in our pre-meeting on Monday about that, engaging the real estate community in responsible ways in any way that we can. I know, Amy, you've been invited to speak to them, which I think would be fantastic. Maybe we um, tap Lydia to kind of get her help and thoughts on how we can better um, partner with that community. I might um, speak to that, uh, the, the Silvar, it's called Silvar, the Silicon Valley Realtor Group or something. <laughs> not uh, association of realtors there we go um and we in the past have been invited to come and talk so um we haven't been invited recently but i did uh suggest that uh, they invite me um and i would welcome you know any anyone who wants to partner with me to um to present um mm -hmm. what we're doing now with this survey etc and the there's always something to say um to help them because they have a big job to communicate and we would prefer that they don't just steer everybody, you know, all the potential buyers to us right. ad nauseum, um, that they would have more, uh, more to say <laughs> and mm -hmm. accurate. I would love to partner with you on that. There's one um, real estate company out of LA. I think it's called GBL Properties and they are like a historically minded real estate uh, agency. Um, and so they have some really great, uh, ideas or examples or resources. And I'm happy to reach out to, the, to them too, as we um, plan that presentation. So they do exist. <laughs> the, the advocates on the real estate side do exist. Sounds great. Um, is there, uh, so I see that there's been an edit there. That looks great. Um, I think, does that um, incorporate some of the issues you're hoping to discuss? Yes, I have real-time yeah. modifications yeah. in yellow. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. That looks much better to me. And then anything else? Well, um, I guess I, I feel like um, a lot of this could use a little pre-work and um, some of it started on community outreach um, and I would be willing to um, organize a little more information on the, um, the total picture of the inventory update aside mm -hmm. from the, um, the, mo the most recent survey. So um, I would volunteer to do that. Okay. I think it'll work better, you know, Margaret Mills Act. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that, that if we, at least one or two of us do a little pre work on each of these items or most of these items that we can get a lot more out of the meeting rather than walking away with a lot of questions that we don't have the answers to. Yeah, I know I will have some slides like an informal presentation just to guide our discussion. Um, so if anybody else wants to prepare something, will we have a um, a mo like a screen in the room? Yes, okay, in the great. community room, it's just a big screen, two big screens actually, great. and connected to um, you know PowerPoints and stuff. Yeah. So. Blinking cursor waiting for somebody that wants to I mean, partner with me if they want. Um, I'm happy to work on that. I know we're also talking about it today, so it may just be a bit of a, like a wrap up to today's discussion. Yeah. And, and yeah, let's see where we get with today's discussion. I feel like the updates to the review process bulletin also kind of goes with outreach because it's community facing. So could kind of get lumped into that one or uh, as a side piece of that. Okay. Um, is everyone okay with moving on to our next item to talk about the review bulletin? Good. Um, okay, let's let's do that. Does anybody have anything before we start it that they need to disclose or related to this? Oh, I want to step back a step on the. Um, 
<laughs> on our retreat. And um, I'm wondering, um, okay, so the dividers we've kind of settled, but I think it would be nice to have a, sort of a general discussion of our meeting. Um, like I would, okay, personally, I'd like to move these meetings to the community room. Um, I think that, that it would be nicer if, you know, since I, I just think it would be a better venue for us. Um, and I don't know whether we actually need to talk about that at the retreat, but um, I think it would be an, you know, sort of general housekeeping if we could just add that in there somewhere. Yeah, actually, you know, I wouldn't mind a discussion about sort of general stuff too. Like, I, I, you know, even I, I would be interested in discussing actually like meeting time as well. Like, you know, one thing I've wondered about is whether, you know, incorporating evening meetings more frequently might, you know, engage members of the community who aren't able to come during business hours, maybe a little bit better, um, you know, and if that's something that's, you know, either desirable or feasible, but to at least explore it. Yeah, so, so maybe not just time, maybe just general housekeeping, you know, and under that we have, um, you know, meeting times, um, format, location, blah, 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 blah. And anything we can come up between now and then. And then I, I don't know if it's, you know, if it makes sense to even agendize something like this or it would like evolve organically. But, you know, if there's even like a little space during the meeting for people to just kind of throw out like ideas they've had, you know, like sort of a, you know, just like a session where people can can share the random thing they've been thinking about or, you know, kind of just the, the little idea that doesn't seem to fit well with any of the other discussion topics. But, you know, just to share those too. I, I don't know what you'd even open session. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Open up. <clears throat> okay. Now we're are we all set. Yeah. Okay, great. So then let's, let's move on to the, um, the discussion of the, um, like the, the bulletin and preservation policies. And you know, I'll do a brief yeah. presentation. I know we have somebody in the uh, public who wants to speak okay. to this item as well. Um, somebody special. <laughs> um, we have, uh, this is the 2016 bulletin, I call it, because that is when it was approved by this board and uh, in previous incarnation um, of the Historic Resources Board and published. Um, and then in December, 2017, the city council adopted uh, the, the comprehensive plan update, which included um, a number of historic preservation policies, including this new policy L7.2, which has been the reason since 2018, we've been individually assessing properties where we think, you know, where they say they want to demol demolish it or they're going to sail and they want to know if they can say they can demolish it. So that's been the activity case by case that staff's been involved in um, to evaluate those properties based on that policy. So the bulletin became out of date and it has not been updated and it was with, withdrawn from the web page because it was not quite accurate. Um, now we're at a juncture where we are doing this update of our inventory and it's really a good time to take a look at this and make the changes. Um, it's not an easy one to, to change. Um, we, we came to this conclusion back then that there were group A and group B um, types of projects for review. It's all based on what the lens of what needs to be reviewed and by what method. So the group A resources were the category ones and twos. It was based on the ordinance as it states category ones and twos and categories threes and fours in the downtown. That's what the ordinance says. And then um, located in the historic districts, Professorville or Ramona Street, um, not including the Eichler districts. So um, this is how this has been. Um, this was set forth uh, that those group A resources um, would need to be reviewed 
pursuant to the Secretary of Interior Standards, um, discretionary applications such as individual review, the two-story home review, variances, home improvement exceptions, this kind of thing, and then architectural review if they're not single family homes. Um, to see if there's impacts, um, if it's not a minor alteration and not compatible with um, SOIS or uh, an impact, then we refer the application to the HRB for review and comment for these types of resources. So um, one of the things that came up before, and this is on the bulletin, shows these, you know, what, what we do. The planner reviews it for consistency. Um, if it's inconsistent, and, or exceeds the scope of minor alteration, um, according to the ordinance, then this is referred to the HRB. Um, and um, one discussion was, well, what is, a, what is a minor alterations? What is major? How does that work? Um, we do have FAQs on the webpage um, that state these things here. When do they need review by the HRB? When do they not need review by the HRB? Um, then there's the group B resources. And these are those that are listed as categories three and four and located outside of the downtown or outside of Professorville. Um, and then uh, there are some that are listed, I guess, um, on the two on the national and state register. Um, that I, that's that's a question is are there some that are listed there that are not on our inventory i would find that surprising um and then there are, are those that have been listed um as eligible the ones the 165 found eligible that were not covered by the ordinance so this is in the process we're in now to place them on the on our formal local inventory so this was in your packet. I don't know if anyone got a chance to review these, but, and it's also, we have our web pages that explain these things and have the FAQs. Um, one topic I think was, um, you know, when do we do these historic resource evaluations? And so this is the thing that's new since the comp plan is based on policy L 7.2, you know, when somebody wants to find out cause they're a property owner, we don't do evaluations for interested buyers. That is where we draw the line only for property owners and they have to pay us. And then we have kind of the firewall where we're, we're dealing directly with the consultant. Um, so then once it's determined eligible, California register el uh, ed eligible, it's then considered a, uh, a group B resource. And then if it's determined not eligible, then we're, it, we take it off just our system and we consider it not a resource. So, um, and then this question of what's minor changes. So this is one of the FAQs um, that's on our webpage. I mean, I think we have a pretty good set of web pages. This was um, updated when we had a qualified professional on staff, Emily Vance. So um, these have not been changed since, um, but this is one of these kind of gray areas. What, to what extent can you mi uh, modify a historic resource um, and still call it minor versus major? You know, and then of course there's the activity of reviewing for Secretary of Interior Standards Compliance. We utilize our um, on-call consultant to, to make those determinations help staff with that process. I'm gonna stop there. Okay. Um, do we have public comment on this issue before we? Yes, we have one, uh, Dennis Backlund. He'd like to speak to this item. Okay. I think this, yes, this is on. Uh, my name is Dennis Backlund. From 2000 to 2014, uh, I worked in the planning department here as the historic preservation planner. Uh, I did the staff reports for all the pro projects and uh, I concluded the reports by uh, presenting recommended findings on how the details of the project and particularly any changes that were going to be made 
to a historic resources board uh, complied with the secretary's standards. And uh, I was always concerned to be um, fully detailed on exactly why something did, did or did not comply with the secretary's standards so that the board would be assisted in, in knowing how to proceed with the project. Uh, the project I wanted to talk with you about, I think most of the board members that are here, uh, some of you were not on the board at that time. It was a meeting that was held on May 14th, 2020. And that is on your website, and you, any of you can watch that, that meeting uh, if you like. And the subject was proposed changes to one of Palo Alto's most important and dramatic historic resources, which is the President Hotel on University Avenue. It was the largest building, the largest uh, design ever done by our, our iconic architect, Burge Clark. And by and large, the building has survived more or less intact. Uh, the board, when they conducted this meeting in May 14, 2020, did some very good things. I remember board member uh, Wimmer brought up the question of preserving the historic tile at the base of the building. And I believe her comments were instrumental in getting that tile preserved because the applicant had thought about replacing all of it so that it would be all matching along the, uh, the sidewalk. And Burge Clark presented variety rather than uniformity to enliven his designs. So we've always been grateful to board member Wimmer for making this happen with the tile. Uh, I presented a booklet uh, that was to be given to the board. Maybe you haven't had, oh yes, they're giving it now. And you can just flip to the one page that has the blue marker and it shows a picture of the President Hotel with the uh, most dramatic historic uh, feature on that facade, which is the upper balcony. And you can see that it is stained, uh, uh, brown stained wood. And what the applicant proposed was to change that. And yet it was in original condition. And I think usually to meet the secretary standards, a historic feature that has not been altered, you don't alter it. And there was a moment in that meeting where uh, something key that I would have thought invited board comment, something occurred in that moment. And that was when the applicant said that the stained brown balcony they proposed to enhance by painting it a color that was called black top, which was a shade of black. And this is a major change. Uh, as it turned out, it was never painted that black. What happened, the applicant later decided that since the brand color of their company, AJ Capital, is navy blue, that they would like to stamp their brand color on the president. And so they proposed navy blue for all of the wood elements on the building. And it was brought back to a board subcommittee and that was approved. And uh, I asked the applicant why the navy blue, and he explained that is our company's brand color. We didn't know if the HRB would approve it, but if they did, we would get to stamp our brand on the building that we own. So, and, excuse me, the, the comment time is um, a bit over already. Is Would you like to, um, you know, Get wrap up, make make some concluding remarks. There, there's a time limit. 
Oh, yes. Comments, yeah. <laughs> I understand. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I will wrap it up. And so um, I'll conclude with saying what the final motion was. Uh, I believe it was made by board member Bernstein and adopted by the board. And that was that these changes that I had just described um, were found to come. We find as a board that those this project complies with the secretary's standards. I watched the meeting three times carefully. There was no comment in the motion how the project and the changes being made to the facade complied with secretary standards, simply the statement that they did. There was never any comment when the applicant said, we want to change these colors and finishes on the front facade. Uh, the board never commented on that. They just, you know, we've heard the comments, okay. And so my recommendation for the board processes is that first, it's clearly identified what a style is being dealt with in the case of President Spanish colonial revival. What are the character defining features? Uh, stained dark wood is how Burge Clark approached it in every building that he did. And now that is gone. And I'm afraid I received comments from about 15 people that were very upset about what had happened to the president and felt that it was no longer truly a Spanish colonial revival building. And so there it is. I guess that's all I have to say. And the board might want to discuss how to prevent something like this from ever happening again. And I leave that to your discretion. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say it's nice to see you again, Dennis. Thank you for taking the time to come talk to us. Um, is it an appropriate time at all to further discuss what Dennis has presented to us? Or yes, please. Yeah, we can do that. And also um, board questions related to the bulletin update, too. Yeah, because I don't want to get off track. I always get off track. But I, um, I just, I did want to acknowledge Dennis and all the amazing amount of years that you contributed so so much time and so much effort and we really miss you here in the chambers i think because you brought a wealth of knowledge experience and passion to historic preservation i don't think there's anyone been you're not replaceable so i just was acknowledging that you did a tremendous job for all of us and i was on the board when you were still active so I have fond memories and I loved hearing all of your amazing stories and you're a piece of history yourself. Um, but I do wanna comment regarding that project because I agree that um, I, I thought that the review went really well. Um, we listened to the applicants proposed changes. We thought that they were within the keeping but I do recall them changing those colors. And I personally had a problem with it. And GoGo, -Go, myself and David Bauer were on that subcommittee and we met them on site and they presented a whole new color scheme and we did not like it at all. In fact, I went out after that, I went and looked at all the colors that Burge Clark had on his buildings and brought that to them and said, hey, these are more appropriate colors but they didn't listen to, to us, which is a problem that we have with that word discretionary. We're a discretionary board. We're not, it's not mandated, it's discretionary. So we struggle with that because we, we, we didn't like the color, we didn't like the blue. We, they wanted to paint the doors red and GoGo -Go said, you need to keep these doors um, mahogany. So that, I thought that was a really great suggestion. I thought they were gonna paint all this, the ground floor doors red. That would have been horrible in my opinion. But, um, I th and I think that's a point of, of great discussion. Like how, we know we're discretionary, but how can we be impactful enough where people will actually abide by what our recommendations are? And I think, there, I think that is 
the struggle of our board and how how to enforce things in in, in uh, an environment that we can't really enforce things like legally or um, but we did we did struggle with those colors. I still struggle with them every day. I walk by that building. <laughs> Not just the balcony color, the entire wall color, I think is completely wrong, but they didn't listen to our advice. But in, in terms of learning from it, what can we learn from it? That's a really good subject to discuss. How can we be more impactful? And I think because it was a, an on-site subcommittee, it wasn't documented, like no one was there taking minutes. So that's when you said that we I, f I feel like just because that wasn't documented, it wasn't in the on the books that we did that step. We did, we did that step. So something though to learn from. I agree. So would anyone else like to comment on this, or we can kind of move on to the bulletin as well? Okay, well, I can kick things off with the bulletin. But, um, so one thing I you know I've mentioned um, with Amy is also, you know, if we're reviewing the bulletin and making revisions, I think it might be important to include some language about like the Eichler historic districts, because it, it sounds as though they fall into kind of an interesting category in and of themselves. Um, in terms of how they're treated because of their presence in the district, um, in one case, an HOA um, and, and that sort of thing. So I don't know if you want to comment on the Eichler specifically, but um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So the Eichler uh, districts um, that we have, there's two. One is the Green Meadow district, which is um, a single story overlay zoning on it, which means that we don't see the individual review uh, discretionary process for that entire neighborhood. And it's very large district. Um, so we are not seeing discretionary review projects coming through the city. Discretionary review projects that require, you know, somebody's approval um, following, you know, the, you know, the guidelines and the, um, you know, making findings and all that. That's one way that we have access to talk with people about historic preservation and, you know, the ICWA guidelines that we work so hard um, to, to create and publish and everything. We can talk with people at the building permit process, but the building permit process is a ministerial process. We can't put conditions on those as if, as long as they meet the zoning development standards, you know, height, setback, et cetera, they um, can be approved at a building permit level. So it's not discretionary. We do our best um, in say the, the Green Meadow area. We're helped in the Green Meadow area by, um, they have a, an architectural control committee, I think they call it. And so they have a couple of architects that people are supposed to go and talk with when they're gonna change their, their home or build a new home. Um, the problem in an Eichler, so I'm using Green Meadow cause that's you know, more defined, they have an architectural control committee, whereas the Green Gables, Eichler um, district, that's National Register district, doesn't have that. And so there's been some erosion up there, um, more so than in Green Meadow, I think. Um, but I think th the problem is in a, in a, the Eichler district has contributors and non-contributors. So the contributors are the ones that really make it hit the historic district and add, add that significance. Um, and then there's non-contributors. This happens up in Professorville too. Um, so anyhow, um, I, I think I get lost in this, but you know, there's, there's definitely, there's historic districts that are Eichler districts. There's a lot of Eichler district or uh, tracts in Palo Alto. We have 2,500, I think, Eichler homes. Um, in Palo Alto, the, the largest concentration anywhere, I think. Um, but there's only two historic districts. The rest of them, um, we, again, encourage use of the Eichler guidelines, but... Um, there really isn't like kind of a special level of protection for even a contributor within an Eichler district as things are currently written. Correct. Again, mostly because I'm thinking of Green Meadow where 
people are not coming through with their discretionary permits. So there's nothing, um, it's kind of like the category threes and fours outside mm -hmm. of Professorville or downtown where they come through, there's not a lot of protection for those homes mm -hmm. okay. um, if they're not doing a discretionary review. Um, so uh, are the Eichler districts um, considered group A or group B? The two historic districts, Eichler districts are considered group B. I'm gonna pull that up so we know what we're looking at. Sorry. It doesn't read that way to me. Um, well, let's see. The group B was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. That's in there. So, so that's well, the Amy, two Eichler So my tracks. thing is um, located in one of the city's locally designated historic districts. Oh, we not local, It's not locally designated. Thank you. I think that's a little too subtle for some of us. It's a big factor in everything we do. Is it a locally on our, you know, inventory locally designated versus is it on the national register and not, not on the local register? You know, we, we have, it's different based on what our code. Okay. Says. So what does it take to move listed on the national register of historic places? What well, I don't have any clue why that would not be category A. That seems bizarre. I mean, I don't, you said you don't know if we have them, and I guess. Well, I, I guess we do because we have the two Eichler the districts they, that are listed on the National Register that are not, um, that are, we consider Group B. And well, how do we get them to be Group A? Well, that would then come to evaluating, um, I think, each home individually to. Yeah, and we might want to put this on the retreat because that's kind of a deep dive into Eichler specifically. Um, but so noted that we need to put in language about Eichler districts and homes. Yeah. Well, and we do seem to have some misalignments between uh, local district designations and national register designations because we, it looks like there's some, you know, Eichler neighborhoods that are nationally registered designated but not locally designated. And we also have the inverse of that in Professorville, where some properties are on the local register but are not within the boundaries of the national district. So there's there seems to be kind of some misalignment going both directions. Actually, yes, the Professor Bill, there are two sections of Professor Bill. One's the National Register and one's the locally local district. So yeah. that that's the boundaries are not the same. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, so maybe we can talk further about uh, you know, Eichler's. <laughs> so then my question would be what kind of information do we want before we have that discussion? Because it would be nice to settle the bulletin. So do we need properties identified? Do we need to know how many are the non-contributors in the Eichler districts identified somewhere? The only thing we have for the two national districts are the, the nomination forms, um, which are not highly detailed. They were prepared by volunteers. Um, it was not a city effort. As far as I know, it was a group of volunteers that decided to do that. And are the like the specific boundaries of those districts available somewhere like through the city website or like is there is there a resource to just see exactly where they start and stop? I imagine there is, but um, I'll check the website after this okay. um, meeting and and let you know okay. uh, let the board know. Um, at a minimum. Um, when we talk about Group B historic resources, could we distinguish between properties on the National Register individually and properties and districts on the National Register? Because I think that it uh, it doesn't read well the way it is. And I think if we if we just identified National Register districts, um, that would be clearer um, because. As you said, it's highly unlikely that there are national register properties that aren't 
on our inventory, but if there are, we should figure that out. <laughs> um, but I think that would be something, individual properties that are on the National Register should be definitely be Group A. And then if we need, I think we need to distinguish between the districts and the individual properties. So if we were to make changes as proposed to this bulletin, would it have to go back to the city council for approval, basically? So the city council did not approve this. This was not sent to them. This was just approved by the AR HRB for staff use and for the oh, public. Got it. So, um, you know, to the extent that there are changes that would make a change to the ordinance, then that would not be able to happen just by the HRB deciding to do that. It would have to be a proposed changes to the city's historic ordinance. So that's another exercise entirely. Mm -hmm. So again, this, this bulletin has to be accurate with respect to the code chapter 1649 mm -hmm. of the municipal code. Um, it can offer advice and, and guidance as well, based on the Eichler guidelines, the professor bill guidelines, best practices, but it, it cannot depart from what the code allows us to do. And the group A, group B, is that is completely just for internal use. That is not a part of the code. Correct. That was Great. conceived of to help steer people into which review process do you go into Got based it. on other factors. So the bulletin is really just here to explain to somebody who might like to make an alteration, you know, the, How the rules of the road. It. Yeah. <laughs> so my suggestion would be to mimic the language in group A, um, where it says located in the city's locally designated historic districts, Professorville um, or Ramona Street, and mimic that in group B, where it says nationally registered historic districts and identify Green Meadow and its companion. Can I ask for clarification? So in the group B group, you would change, now I'm showing that on the screen, where it says listed on the National Register or California Register, your bullet two, are you suggesting? I would actually change? move it to the bottom where the other, where it, uh, the, it appears in group A. And um, I would say districts, um, National Register districts. And if we do have national register properties that are not on his, our historic inventory, shame on us. Okay, so just to make sure. So the second bullet, you would, you would move to the bottom as it's written, and then you would add another bullet into this group B. No. Go back to the previous page, group A. Okay. And I would just mimic the language. I would replace the second bullet with, oh God, I'm blind. Sorry. Um, located in one of the city's National Register Historic Districts, I Green see. Meadow, or why am I spacing on the other one? Green, Green Gables. Gables. So you would, okay. So you would take this bullet three, modify it to say Eichler or whatever the, uh, and I nationally get, registered. Yes. Um, yeah. So there's there's additional changes that would have to happen with that, just because of Professorville having both local and national register. Um, but that's fine. That's these are doable changes. Oh, I got you. So the language would have to be modified because it is also. Uh, well, but I think if you identify Green Meadow and Green Gables as nationally registered historic yeah. districts, I think that's clear. And maybe there needs to be a closer tie that it they're not national registered districts and Green Gables and Green Meadow. And I think I had the same problem with Group A when you said Professorville. And I was reading national, yeah, locally registered historic districts. Yeah. Um, so, so this is definitely the kind of work that needs to be done to improve this bulletin. Obviously, okay. we it's a little bit too generic and it's not capturing the precision that we need it to capture. To that end, another um, discrepancy within the bulletin that I noticed um, is on packet page 15. Um, 
So our historic categories are listed as category one, two, three, or four, and category one is exceptional, category two is major, three or four are contributing. Um, but in the, again, the historic district bullet C at the bottom, um, the last sentence says that all structures and sites within a historic district are categorized as significant on the historic inventory. But it, in categor categories one, two, three, and four, significant is not a category. So it means nothing. Oh, so if you go to packet page 16, mm -hmm. the definition of significant building is, is um, item F, means any building, group of buildings or site categorized on the historic inventory as number one or two and all structures within historic districts. So I think what she's pointing out is that we again have this problem with historic districts that this actually, I assume this predates us even having local districts. So that when we say historic districts, we're referring to Professorville in downtown. We're not preferring, referring to Green Meadows and Green Correct. Gables. Right. But that's not clear. So we need an yeah. ordinance update. Thank you. It's time. Yeah, it's just, it is confusing. I mean, if I was trying to figure out as a member of the public, oh my God, this is <laughs> like a mess. Yeah, I think maybe having, uh, the it, it is, I think there's a, there's confusion here because of these national registered districts that are not on the local inventory. So maybe some, you know, if if the, if the property is in one of these two zones, here's this other thing that applies to them because it's it, it's not it, it's just sort of an odd category. Yeah, and then it like you know kind of outside of the bulletin, then there's the separate question of like whether aligning the districts locally and nationally makes sense, but that seems to be beyond the scope of what the bulletin is actually able to cover currently. Yeah, and you make me uh, think of uh, the need to just go ahead and take a, a look at those Eichler guidelines because I, I believe there is, you know, a bit of preamble there um, that we can draw from um, and because that was, a, a again, a professional study. Paige and Turnbull was the consultant that prepared those. Um, so, yeah, I think it's good to look at those in concert. I guess, Amy, do you, do you I mean, I feel like what I've just heard means that the ordinance is out of date. The ordinance itself is out of date, not just the bulletin. When we talk about historic districts and we don't address local or national. The historic ordinance hasn't been updated since it was written as far as, I mean, there might've been some things in the seventies there, but um, you know, that was an effort as you remember uh, to update the ordinance in concert with that last survey. So um, one of the goals in our, in our work plan and in the comp plan is to s review the hist, I'll, I almost remember it, review the historic preservation ordinance for its effectiveness. So is it effective? This is, the, this is on our work program to study the historic ordinance and see if it's effective. So this is what we're doing right now is basically saying, oh, look, since it was written in 1970s, we have two new districts. And so it's not effective for the Eichler districts. Yeah, it seems like there, there are some gaps. And it, it also seems like the ordinance in general leans pretty heavily on CEQA. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that that seems to be the route through which properties are identified. Yeah, you know? I, I noticed that as well, that CEQA is kind of the forcing function. Um, so that a lot of this review is unfortunately arising when people are like, well, we want to demolish it. It's like, whoa, 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 might be historic. It's, it's a little uh, backward, unfortunately. And I don't know if that's just because of resources. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think it relates to not to wade in, but um, you know, we've had in the past, um, demolitions in his in professorville that kind of thing and we had to have an eir and and all of that and so that was that kind of drove getting this process bulletin together because there were kind of guidelines for staff what to do what to do when there's a CEQA impact so i think yes you're seeing with the bulletin that it's really focused on you know do we have discretion or not that's what it's all about and then how to tease out how, where to send people and it's confusing for everybody so it just I'm so I'm clear on this. The objective of this bulletin when it was written was to provide a key for 
various points of view to follow a path and determine the context, the historic context of the of a property. So is that is that more than one audience? Is that uh, owner applicants? Is it um, builders? Is it the real estate people who are conveying information? I'm just trying to understand who all the audiences are. And I, I mean, it's clear to me a lot of effort was put into this to, to make it compact and therefore more consumable. But based on what I'm hearing it and what my experience was, it actually has a reverse effect because it puts the onus on the reader who you have to assume has a reasonably low understanding to kind of work through all these threads. But is that, am I right here? Or is that, or close? That that's the intent, intent and purpose? You know, it was, it was the intent that I understand was really to have, yeah, a concise, easy-ish document for anybody to look at and go, okay, now I know what to do because I'm in group A. Now I know what to do because I'm in group B, you know, or I'm processing a, an application that's in group B. There's the reverse side of the bulletin. There's, there's the descriptors. And then there's, here's what, here's the process. I'm going to show you that one. Yeah. So group A, this is what we do. Hey, if it comes in and, and it's on this side of the thing, this is what we do. If it's on this side of the, this column, this is what we do. I mean, it's certainly better than having to sift through the code on your own, which I think is the alternative. Um, and so <laughs> having, you know, I think having an updated bulletin available to people is, is a useful thing. You know, if, if the underlying ordinances are confusing, there's not a lot the bulletin can do. <laughs> yeah. So taking all of this together, I actually didn't find a lot of in like glaring problems, maybe uh, except for the national register versus local register points um, with the document on pages 12 and 13, that was actually pretty straightforward. I felt like, okay, as a member of the public, you know, you identify if you're group A or group B, and then you go to the flow chart. Okay. What does this mean for me? That this is actually okay, I think. Um, it's more the the actual ordinance that's like confusing and convoluted. Um, out of date. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just want to make sure that when we're talking about the bulletin, the bulletin is pa packet pages 12 and 13, correct? That's correct. That's okay. the bulletin. Okay. Okay. So we're not like it in as deep muddy waters as we thought where if at all is the historic preservation ordinance chapter 16.49 available to the public it's online and in okay. the development center if they walk in okay and if i'm getting this right the preservation bulletin pages 12 and 13 again are based off of the historic preservation ordinance correct packets pages 14, 15. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Amy, uh, speaking of out of date, um, so on page 18, when we talk about timelines should be made within 20 days of receipt of the proposal, are those just totally ignored? I mean, they, they just seem like very, I mean, 20 days. We don't do anything in 20 days. Okay, so let's just be clear what you're looking at. So page 18 of the packet is 1649-040, designation of historic uh, structures and sites. So this is when somebody wants to designate their site, right? Yes, and okay. I think I just highlighted um, section two at the very last line, but I think there are also other short-term timelines in here that I did not highlight, but I'm not sure. So um, so item two, within 20 days of receipt of the proposal, I'm just wondering if that is just something that has just fallen by the wayside. I just think there might be enough in here that we have a very strong case for updating our ordinance just to be functional. <laughs> So I think um, uh, I'm sure there's more that you want to say about that. I'll just try to answer your question, first question about um, this item too. So this, the way this reads, it's when we're, when they're in the process of being designated and they're proposing to modify the structure, this is when the 20 days is, is relevant. 
So um, we don't have that situation where somebody is coming forward to designate their property and they're also, uh, you know, changing it. Um, that hasn't happened in my experience here. People aren't coming forward to designate their properties while, while, while trying to demolish it. Or yeah. period. <laughs> we don't it, have people it, coming forward saying, yeah. I want to designate my property. Yeah. Okay. And is that something where when we add these hopefully 140 some properties, the inventory might become a thing? When we get to that point, we're going to have the community meeting. We're going to have outreach. We're going to hear from the property owners themselves. And, you know, we can check and see if their permits on file uh, for those addresses and have conversations. And then it'll be up to the, I mean, the HRB doesn't get to place them on the inventory. They, they can nominate and, and provide recommendations to council and council makes the decision. But actually that makes it sound like at least in theory, that section could be triggered by the current inventory work, depending upon what is already in the pipeline for some of those properties. Right. So once yeah. there becomes a proposal for designation, I don't think that's just our consultants report. I think it's when the HRB makes a nomination and recommends to city council. If there is also a realization that there's a project underway that is going to significantly impact the resource, mm -hmm. then we would hustle that to the council mm -hmm. within 20 days. That particular property, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I haven't been in this situation before. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I also have a question. When it says this inventory is maintained in the Department of Planning, Community Environment, what kind of state is our inventory in? Sorry, are you looking at the ordinance? Packet page 17, um, section 4. Research available information. Inventory is maintained in the Department of Planning and Community. And I'm just wondering what our maintenance level is. So uh, we have binders that, it, that we maintain in our physical space. So like this? Yes. Okay. I have them in my office. Um, and we have some down in the, in level A of this building. Um, we also have binders across the street in the development center um, to, if anyone asks. Um, and then we also have, of course, our GIST system that has, you know, the parcel report, the parcel report. So people can independently online query a, an address and it comes back to say, you know, is it category one, two, three, or four? Is it found eligible? Um, the 165, is it potentially eligible and never went beyond the windshield survey? Uh, that's through the parcel report process. But um, we, we, our original inventory is not online in any way, shape or form, except for a list of those properties. Yes, our inventory list of addresses is online and I believe we have a link to past, which maintains color pictures and um, individual pages that have the entire contents of the inventory form um, translated into a one page. I mean, the inventory forms are so light from the 1970s that they fit onto one page of description. Does anybody have additional comments about the bulletin? I mean, it sounds like they're kind of, I'm hearing kind of two kind of sets of thoughts here. One is about the bulletin itself and how well it's, you know, doing or could do of explaining the current regulations to people. But then there's also this question of like, how well is that ordinance working? And so some of those things are a bit, you know, outside of the scope of the bulletin you know, the bulletin specifically as it's written, but that there, are, it sounds like there are kind of some questions and issues and concerns there that, that are in addition. Does that? Well, I think, 
I mean, on packet page 10, I, I think we had a question about has this ordinance been updated since it was put into place? Um, and if it says the current version of the ordinance is from 1980. So it's probably like our inventory due for an update. Um, I don't find as much, to your point, I don't find as much um, problem with the bulletin itself. I think it's really the ordinance that supports it that is, is due for the update. Yeah, also on page 11, I had um, put a little um, paragraph in there about the last time they tried to update the ordinance. I mean, there was an interim ordinance that was happening at the same time as the survey. And then there was this proposal for a permanent change to the ordinance that seemed to be uh, changing that key piece where in today's ordinance, the ordinance that we have now, it, it you can designate properties without the consent of the owner, whereas in this ordinance update back in the 1998 timeframe, it talked about um, that only the property owner could nominate a home to the register. So that's kind of a very big difference. Um, and I think that bears discussing. I mean, right now we're in a process that the HRB could nominate and the, app, the owner could say, wait a minute, not so fast, I don't want that. And then that's up to the council to decide. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a consideration in re a rewrite of the ordinance is how that would read. So Amy, do we have that um, information on the recommendation, the, the last recommendations for the ordinance update? Does, have we been given that? And I forgot. Uh, I, I have not sent a, a report whatever report that was to council maybe um, that had a recommendation for changes, you know, that was, I, I have not found that or sent that. Well, where did you find this information? Was this just something you remembered from the ordinance update or, or the proposed ordinance update? Sorry. No, I wasn't part of that back then. <laughs> um, I found it in kind of our share drive of discussion about what happened back then. Yeah. So it's a kind of a staff uh, description about that time period, but I could certainly hunt and find, you know, what that was, the draft ordinance. There was an interim ordinance that was in effect and that was went away because the permanent ordinance didn't uh, get adopted. Yeah. I don't think we're so concerned with the interim ordinance. We burned that bridge. Um, but I do think that, um, it would be good for us to have the, I mean, if that work has already been done and there were already proposals for how to modify our ordinance, I think that would be a really good starting point for us to modify the ordinance. I will search that online. Right. Any last comments? Yeah, I. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, there's instability here. I mean, ordinances I don't think change very rapidly. We have to kind of work with what we have. And yeah, a key and an explanation works for most people. But uh, I'm just throwing this out. It wouldn't be good if uh, for buyers, real estate agents, everybody else, they could at least pinpoint what area they're in, in a simple way, and go and find the basic information. And, and just narrow down the, the amount of work they have to do to, to get to where they have questions and can get responses to them. I mean, it'd be great if something like that could be handed out by a real estate agent, for example. If you're in this district, this historic district, where there's inconsistencies, what are they? And they at least, you know, narrow down the anxiety level and the lack of clarity uh, and facilitate things a little bit more quickly. Oh, um, board member Pease, I'm wondering if you can, when you speak into the mic, maybe pull the mic on the other side so you can face people and then <laughs> you'll, it'll capture more of what you're saying. Did you not hear that? Oh, okay. yeah. We heard it. It's okay. for the transcription. That's all. 
Um, can I comment to that? So um, just because we have uh, an online parcel report system that it tells you if you're in a flood zone, it just establishes what your FAR, your lot coverage and everything. It does have a line about historic, um, if you are historic or not. So, I mean, maybe that's where we could include some of this information. I don't know if that's possible. If for each, I mean, it would take a bit of work, but for each property, it could say you're a category A resource, or I, I don't know if that's even possible. Well, it does say you're a category one, two, three, or four, and mm -hmm. it does say deemed eligible if it's one of these 165, and it does say potentially eligible if it appeared on the windshield survey from 1998 and didn't go further as far as wasn't found ineligible or eligible. And these are the ones that when people come in, we say, hold on, we have to do an evaluation and see if you're California register eligible. So that, that's all there in the parcel report. Does, does that data set also say definitely not eligible, like found to be ineligible? It will say found ineligible, okay. you know, and it will give, you know, 2020 or whatever, when I think it says that when Dames and, or sorry, when Paige and Turnbull <laughs> more recently did the study okay. and found ineligible. Okay. Yeah. So we're not bringing those reports of found ineligible for each and every time to the HRB because people are making decisions about buying a property or what have you mm -hmm. um, to, to the HRB. But every year in the CLG annual report, I do have a whole list of found eligible, found ineligible, um, more found in, ineligible. Um, but I'm not bringing the DPR forms that are prepared, but they're extensive. I mean, yeah. talk about the difference between 1978 and today's DPR mm -hmm. forms. They're mm -hmm. quite extensive. Yeah. So I guess at least we do have a safety net in terms of people being able to look up a property. They know that they're on some kind of a, you know, a potential uh, list. So it's really up to the buyer or the current homeowner to further investigate what that means for their specific and unique property. Yeah. So, so is that the gold standard source now? Is that the best, most robust, most up-to-date and most accessible source to figure this out if you have the parcel number? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's the source that people who are either owners or buyers or realtors um, at 24 seven can go in and, you know, find out, Hey, can I, you know, can I add any square footage? And you know, what is the square footage? What is the site size? Is it in a flood zone? Is it historic? Yes. Well, I don't want to mess with having more than one bulletin, but it seems to me that if you just had an instruction, a two page instruction about how to do that, it would help people more quickly figure out whether they have any issue at all. Um, Cause all the rest of this stuff is kind of out in the ether right now. So are you saying perhaps the bulletin could like just point people to the resource where they could look up their home, say, you know, if you'd like to look up your property, please go to, and, you yeah. know. And especially if it had a more, not a four line link printed in a, you know, mm -hmm. there was just my, mm -hmm. some, some really simple uh, pointer to it. Uh -huh. But, it, yeah. and then you just had the one, you know, just the steps of what, what to look for. And then a summary of what it might mean. I'm not, not providing specific property information, but give them the context they want. Mm -hmm. so. I think, the, I mean, the, the top of the bulletin does say for information on a specific property, I think it, please review the parcel report. It's the, the second arrow right at the top. Um, and I agree, I think that's a good place for homeowners and realtors to begin, um, and the parcel report shouldn't be foreign to anyone in real estate. I really, really hope. So it, when these realtors ask, act surprised, it's like, did you do the research? Like, it, you know, uh, yeah, I just. But the most common question that I see about historic is from a realtor or a buyer mm -hmm. that's saying, what does this mean potentially eligible? So they've opened up the parcel mm -hmm. report. They've seen that it's potentially eligible and they want to know what that means. Mm. And so, you know, this is where the bulletin, which was done before the comp plan change, um, you know, potentially eligible properties were just like, okay, they're gone basically. Mm -hmm. 
now there's something that we have because of the comp plan policy to study those, which we didn't have previously. So, and do you see this bulletin as potentially like if it if it includes a discussion of you know potentially eligible since that's what they're seeing on the par parcel report? Do you, it, it, do you think that would be something that would be helpful to just be able to send to these folks? You know. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, we have like the email that we have to write specific. I mean, typically I, I do a lot of, you know, responses to emails. So I'll go in into the windshield surveys, priority one, two lists and clip the piece that says, oh, this was, you know, for architecture or for something else, you know, potentially eligible. So that wouldn't be in here because that's site specific, but mm -hmm. Yeah, something that talks about we have this policy 7.2 that requires that we study mm -hmm. this if you're thinking of demolishing it, you know, um, and this is the process. I mean, we do this process where we, you know, ask our consultant to give an estimate of time and, and cost, and then we prepare an invoice and we send that to the property owner, right? Yeah. And then they come back and give us money or they don't, they walk away and, uh, yeah. Yeah. So for some of these, you know, it sounds like we've suggested a few modifications to the bulletin. Is that something that staff can just create a draft of? Um, yes, I mean, that's okay. my intention yeah. is that at the retreat, then I would come back with, um, you know, a, a report and strike an underlying suggestions mm -hmm. for the board to discuss, take okay. one by one. Great. I, I don't think we're going to spend a whole lot of time at the retreat on the bulletin because yeah. there's lots of items. Yeah. So anything else before we move on? All set? Okay. Um, so I'm going to suggest we move on to minutes, minute approval. So first we've got the approval of the, the minutes from the May 11th meeting. Does anybody have any additions, deletions, corrections? Um, so um, in the schedule of meetings and assignments, I think um, election of chair and vice chair will take place on May 25th rather than June 22nd. Are you seeing this on a certain page that you could refer to? It's on packet page 26. Yeah, this is a statement from you, uh, Chair, uh, as Chair Willis, if June 22nd would work. And I said I would put it on the tentative agenda for June 22nd. We're here today. No, no, the um, election of chair and vice chair. Oh, so the very first line. Shoot. Okay, you meant to say May 20. May 25th. May 25th, okay. Thank you. And then there's just a little typo on the next page. I don't care if we correct it or not, but um, packet page 27, Chair Willis opened the discussion um, and sort of midway through the third line down, but others may have, might have gained more historic value. Now, I might've actually said that, but we could pick one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, can, can I make a motion for the minutes? Is that, can I move to approve the minutes as corrected? Second that. All right, uh, would you like us to vote individually or can we just all? I think it's up to you, usually you do voice vote. Let's just do a voice <laughs> vote. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 I abstain. Okay. <laughs> okay, then let's continue on to the minutes from the May 25th meeting. Does anybody have corrections, additions, or deletions?
Doesn't. I'll make a motion to approve. Great. Um, and all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And then does anybody want to make any announcements about board business or announcements for future, the future meeting or anything like that before we finish up? There was no past meeting in June. We're going to have one in July and the walking tours will resume in the fall. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to, um, so are you guys going to put together an agenda um, for our retreat having, or do you want help putting together an agenda for our retreat? I mean, that's kind of what we saw and I've had the yellow changes. Um, Can you email us that page? Sure. That, that would be just nice to have it sooner rather than later. And we can all sort of focus on um, our presentation parts or what we actually agreed to do. <laughs> yeah, so it will be uh, published with the packet for uh, July 28th. But yes, in advance, I can send you the slide today that I modified as we spoke. Um, and certainly any, you know, send me any comments individually that um, if you'd like. Would it be okay to take a shot at allocating time to those items? Because there's a, quite a few of them. And uh, just so we can sort that out in advance a little bit. I, I think that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. So we don't, you know, get really into the weeds on one of them and not end up discussing others. Yeah. So how do you want to do that? Do you want to pull the slide back up and talk about it briefly now? Or do you want to just do it on this? I mean, I'm I'm happy to you know to kind of take a guess at it, and then okay. before we circulate the the agenda, and we can we can just do that. And if anybody has serious concerns, just let us know. Yeah. Like I said, I'm happy if you individually email me back. Not the entire board will, BCC anyways. Um, after I send you the slide, please do send your comments if you have ideas or anything. You know, we're open for suggestions and all that uh, before we craft the online agenda. And Amy, if you do find that ordinance um, proposal, will you send it out as soon as you find it? I'm interested. Okay. Um, so I think um, I will move to adjourn. I will second. second. All right. And then all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Great. Thank you. <laughs>